Is welcome to the Quant Investing webinar series. My name is Tim DeToy, and um, I'm the founder and CEO of Quant Investing. And today I'm going to talk to you about the truth about stop losses that nobody wants to believe. This is what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to show you how stop losses have performed in over 150 years of testing and three years research papers. What type of stop losses performed best? Do they increase or decrease returns? What about false signals? And what stop loss percentage is the best one for you to use? And exactly how to implement a stop loss you know, strategy for your portfolio. And in the end, um, I'll have, or well, there'll definitely be time to answer any questions you may have. So if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to, to type them into the question box that you have. And I'll answer the questions on a first come, first serve basis after the presentation. The first study that I would like to talk about is a paper, um, research paper called When Do Stop Loss Rules Stop Losses? Here the researchers implemented a simple 10% stop loss strategy applied to an arbitrary portfolio. This means they just selected a lot of companies through no specific criteria whatsoever. But this portfolio, they applied a 10% stop loss on the purchase price and when the stop loss was exceeded the portfolio was sold and invested in long-term US government bonds and as soon as this loss for example the 10% was recovered um, in the market then they moved back into stocks they applied this to the US market over a 54 year period from January 1950 to December 2004 and this is what they found over the 54 year period the strategy provided higher returns while limiting losses when it was invested in stocks stocks had higher return than bonds 70 percent of the time so they were right the stop loss helped them to time the market 70 percent of the time and in the stopped out period this means when they were invested in bonds the stock market outperformed only 30 percent of the time so in both these periods the indicator was very very um, accurate and this was yeah, a surprising finding from the research study in the stopped out periods, this means when um, the stop loss kicked in, was evenly distributed over time. This means that it was not only major market crashes that took this portfolio out of the portfolio or out of the stock market, it was distributed evenly over the 54 year test period. There was one yeah, anomaly in the study where um, after the bursting of the tech bubble, yeah, the market must have recovered 10% and then and then really went down a lot because if they excluded that one yeah, data point you can say then these two um then this indicator would have been even more correct than what it was now and i think that it was because the 10 percent was too low but we'll get to that in the other research studies the second study um i'd like to talk about is the performance you know, the paper called the performance of stop loss rules versus buy and hold strategy here yeah, um the researchers compiled a compared a trailing and a traditional stop loss strategy to a buy and hold strategy. They invested in the Stockholm 30 index, that is the 30 largest companies in Sweden, and they rebalanced quarterly. And they tested it over an 11 year period between January 1998 and April 2009. This period is rather short, but you remember that because the internet bubble and the financial crisis fell within this period, it's very important, or it's a very nice period to test in to see how the stop losses will work for your own portfolio to, to limit losses when the market declines substantially. The other nice thing about this study is they tested stop loss levels right from 5% right up to 55%. So it gives you a good idea of what stop, le stop loss level will be the best for you to use. The results of the study is summarized in these two tables that I put together. If you look at the top table, that is a trailing stop loss that they tested. And the bottom table is a traditional stop loss. Now, traditional stop loss is just a stop loss from the purchase price. The first column is B minus H, that's buy and hold. And then 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25% stop losses were tested in the columns to the right. You'll see that I stop at 25% and I don't go up to 55%. It's because after 25, yeah, the stop loss is higher than that or percentage higher than that just didn't add any value. So I just... Um, or I'm just showing 
the best results from the study, basically. And as you can see, the trailing stop loss outperformed the traditional stop loss by quite a large margin. The 15% trailing stop loss level would have given you a cumulative return of nearly 74%, the 20% 60, nearly 64%, whereas the highest return the traditional stop loss um, achieved was 10% at 57%. The mean return was also higher for the 15 and 20% trailing stop loss levels, and the variance was also lower or lowest with the nearly, yes, it was nearly the lowest with a 15% uh, trailing stop loss level. The next chart shows how the value of the, all these, these different portfolios performed over time. The chart may look intimidating, but it's very simple. The portfolio started out with a value of one, then it, and then they showed the return of all the different stop loss levels right until the end of the 11 year test period. You can see that the market still went, went up a little bit. Then it crashed with the internet bubble. It didn't affect these 30 companies that much. Then it increased substantially until the financial crisis. And then the portfolio value decreased quite substantially. But what's interesting here is if you see that the 20% yeah, trading stop loss level, that is the, the broken line right at the top of the chart, it was ahead of the blue line, which is the 15% trading stop loss level most of the time. Only right at the end do you see that the blue line ended above the other one, where the 15% uh, trading stop loss level did better. So either of those two you can really use. There's, uh, there's not much difference between them. And then the third study is have stop loss strategies um, really work with momentum. And it's a paper called Taming momentum crashes, a simple stop loss strategy. Now the simple stop loss strategy, um, just from the purchase price, was applied to a portfolio where they really implemented a simple momentum strategy. Each month they bought the 10% of company, so monthly rebalancing, 10% of companies with the largest six months price gain. And they sold short the 10% of companies with the largest price fall over the past six months. And they tested this strategy over 84 years from January 1926 to December 2011 on all US domestic companies, excluding ADRs. And this is what they found in this table. The, the top uh, row, you can see that was the market performance over the period. The momentum strategy, the second line, that is the pure momentum strategy without any stop loss applied. And then the last three lines is um, momentum where they applied a 10% stop loss strategy, a 15 and 20% stop loss strategy. And you can see um, the average return for the strategies is the average excess return over the market per month. And you can see that a 10% stop loss strategy substantially increased the monthly outperformance over the market. I mean, if the strategy was just a little bit better per, mo per month, 0.99, then the market 0.65, the 10% momentum strategy brought that up to 232 3.2% per month. The standard deviation was also lowest with the 10% stop loss strategy. And then of course the risk adjusted to turn the sharp ratio was also the highest. Look at how much the 10% stop loss uh, decreased the minimum return. The minimum return of the pure momentum strategy was, minus, was nearly minus 50% and the 10% stop loss uh, level is reduced that to 15.4%. That's a substantial improvement. So as you see, stop loss has really helped it, um, to curb momentum crashes, which is a real risk with momentum strategies. So what do these three research studies show? It's three different research studies that tested over 150 years and showed that a simple, simple stop loss strategy provides higher returns while lowering losses. A trading stop loss is better than a fixed percentage stop loss. You saw in the test that compared the two. The best stop loss percentage for you to use is either 15 or 20% with a trading stop loss. A stop loss helps you avoid market crashes and it lowers wild downward movements in your portfolio, which increases your risk adjusted returns. And who doesn't want that? Now we'll go to how to implement a stop loss strategy in your, in your portfolio. This is also exactly the same stop, stop loss strategy that we use in the quant value newsletter. We use a trailing stop loss strategy but we only look at it once a month because what we found is that if you look at it on a daily basis, you simply trade too much. Stocks are much more volatile if you look at it on a daily basis compared to if you look at it on a monthly basis. For example, what we've also seen is that a lot of companies that appear on this list, because I obviously follow the portfolio on a daily basis, they do not appear on the list of companies to sell at the end of the month. 
so it substantially lowers your trading cost, but also the um, the losses that you have through um, bid ask spreads. We use a trading stop loss stop loss level of twenty percent. So you sell the company if the trading stop loss at the end of the month at, or at each month when you look at it, and we measure the trading stop loss in the currency of the company's primary listing. This means if you have a Swiss company, we follow the trading stop loss in Swiss francs, and not in euro if your portfolio yeah, currency, for example, is euro. This simply means you want to have the pure movement of the stock price and not some filter like a currency movements that you uh, look at these price changes through. And what we do then is if a company has been sold through the stop loss, then you invest in your in the current best idea that fits your investment strategy. And then very important, this was a question by a, by a reader recently, is never leave your stop loss orders with your broker. Because of all the computer trading taking place at the moment and high frequency trading, there's a lot of intraday volatility. And if you leave your, your stop loss orders programmed into your online broker account, there's quite a high chance that these orders may get, uh, get executed because of intraday volatility. Whereas at the end of the day, the stock price may close not much difference from what it was the closing price the previous day. So that's the end of the presentation. If you... Um, if you have any questions, simply type in, uh, yeah, type it into the question box, and then um, and then I'll answer them on a first come, first serve basis. I see I've got a question here from Christian. They, um, he asked, when did they get back into the market? Christian, that depended on when they rebalanced. For example, if they re rebalanced on a monthly basis, they would have bought the companies, sold them if there was a stop loss breach over the month, and at the end of the month, they would have bought them again. The other, the second study, the shorter one, uh, the one that they did in Sweden, there um, they rebalanced on a, a quarterly basis. So it means they bought the 30 companies, the largest companies in Sweden, followed them over the month. If the stop loss was triggered, they sold them, kelt cash, and then um, and then at the end of the period, they would just reinvest all that money in the companies. Then, for example, at the end of the quarter, they'll buy them again. Here's a question uh, by Philip. He said, what about a market filter? Well, that's very important. That's something that I didn't want to bring into this presentation. But you can say that um, if the market is falling, then it's no use to buy more companies, right? Because you'll have a stop loss. A stop loss will get triggered. You'll reinvest. And then if the market keeps falling, you'll just sell those companies again. So a simple rule that was very well tested, I think, in over 100 years of prior data, because you can test it quite easily with uh, moving averages, is uh, there's a study by Mabane Faber where he tested that. And he said that the simplest rule that works the best is if the market is below its 200-day simple moving average, simply stop buying. This means if the market is going up, you'll keep on buying. If companies are falling, then you'll sell them with a stop loss. But if the market turns down, you stop buying new companies. In other words, the market is below its 200-day moving average. You won't buy new companies. And as the market falls, the stop losses will be triggered on your existing positions. And you'll be out of the market completely while the market is moving down. I have a question here from Eves. And he asks, uh, why not a trailing stop limit 15 to 20%? Is I'm sure you can select any percentage between 15 and 20 percent. That's just a personal preference. I just took uh, took 20 percent because it's not that sensitive, and you don't trade that much. That much. And then um, Philip had a question. It seems to improve the skew quite a lot. Yes, that's right. Um, let me just go to the presentation again, and then uh, where did what's the second study? I think where was the skewness there's a skewness you can see it in this column here and you can see that the stop loss moved the skewness of returns from um, from negative where it was with a normal momentum strategy to right into the positive territory and it made it a lot more positive than the market performance of 0.19%. Does anybody have any other questions? That seems to be uh, the last question that we had. 
Anybody else? Anyway, that's it. Thank you everybody for attending and I hope you found it valuable. I will send you an email shortly with the, um, where you can download the presentation and watch uh, the webinar again. Just thank you for attending.